Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Saturday. It is the 21st day of October, year of our Lord, 2023. A little late getting started this evening, but we'll get it done. Anyway, we uh, hopefully you enjoyed, we did, hopefully you enjoyed a beautiful fall day. Breezy out there, but a very pleasant temperature nonetheless. And uh, here, our colors are very, very nice today, so it's beautiful if you're outside to just look at the magnificence of God's creation. And there's a nice about a half moon tonight, and uh, beautiful stars out there, not too many clouds in the sky, just those cool clouds that sort of scud by the moon that just give it this air of just beauty and mystery. It's, you got to love the fall evenings, huh? I'll tell you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace of the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Tonight, again, according to the daily lectionary, we read from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 15, picking up where we left off last night, reading the balance of the chapter starting at verse 21. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faithfulness. Great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. And he went up on the mountain and sat down there. And a great crowd came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them, so that the crowd wondered. When they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples him, to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I am willing to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, Where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were four thousand men, besides women and children. And after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. And that is the Gospel of the Lord. And what I want to focus on tonight, we have, of course, a repetition uh, of, not a, of the same event, but the same miracle. Jesus, again, feeds another large crowd, not as quite as large, large as the first, but still a, a huge number, 4,000 people plus, men, plus their families. And before that, uh, a number of healings. But the interesting thing, when it's all interesting because it's God among his people, but this episode with the Canaanite woman. Now we read this this year, this year, and it's coming to a close rapidly. It is Saint Matthew's year in the three-year lectionary in in first first week of December, first Sunday in December, which is where the first Sunday of Advent falls this year. We'll begin the Holy Gospel according to Saint Mark, and then the following year it'll be Saint Luke, and then we're back to Matthew. John is read around Christmas and Easter. We read a very good portion of John, and and then a few other big days throughout the church here, but Christmas, Easter, and we read almost exclusively from John during 
during those times of the church here. Uh, so anyway, we had this reading on Midsummer, and I, I just I find this reading absolutely fascinating. Because one of the things we keep in mind, especially, in, and this is one of the reasons I, there's a discussion about what's the better lectionary. I don't know that it's, that's even the right question to ask. The one year, the three years, it's not like they've been set in stone since time immemorial anyway. Uh, but it is, for the sake of good order, a good idea to pick one and stick with it. And I tend, I, I consider a couple of things, what my preaching strengths are, my educational strengths are. And then what's going on in the circuit around me. So we're kind of all on the same page as a circuit. I think generally, I think we're all using the three-year lectionary in churches uh, of a circuit. And there's, again, there's nothing wrong with the pastor using the one-year lectionary. This is just my preference. And there's a lot of discussion amongst pastors about why we, we do one or the other. But the, the thing I like about the three-year lectionary is that you're reading through during the summer months. You're, you're, it's very linear, meaning you're reading... Just kind of like we read here during this devotion, you're, 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 you're moving through, you skip a few things on the Sunday, uh, obviously you don't cover all of a particular book on the Sunday mornings, but most people, I think, understand that, or just read a tiny fragment of the Bible. But here in these evening devotions, we, we are reading through, we're picking up what we left off, for the most part, once again, and then when church evenings change, we, we often change books, uh, sometimes we don't read the entire thing, but pretty darn close to it. So you get a sense of the motion, anyway. Jesus is, one of the things you see as you read through like that is Jesus is not only demonstrating that he is God among us and he has the authority to forgive sins and he is here to make it right. He's here to undo the fall and bestow upon us salvation, everlasting life, to restore our relationship to God. That's the heart of the gospel. But also he is preparing the church for life when he is invisible to our eyes after the ascension. Now he ascends into the life of the church he certainly ascends and places our humanity at the right hand of God, where God intended it to be. It's a remarkable thing. So in Christ, our humanity is in this amazing position next to God Almighty, the Father, in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. And but he, but he also ascends into the life of the church. And through the life of the church, we receive you know, the Holy Spirit. All, the whole Trinity is involved in the life of the church. The Holy Spirit brings us to the church. Remind us of the words that Jesus said, you know, that, that he enlightens us by the gospel, keeps us in the true faith by that same gospel. And, and the gospel means everything, the whole scripture, the things that the gospel would have us do, baptism, the Lord's Supper. So anyway, he's preparing us for the life that we're in now. And this is a big episode about what that's going to look like. This, so, so this is looking forward to Pentecost, when the church goes out, and you're going to have the great missionaries of Paul, and goes up to the. Uh, I mean, they start with the synagogues, but he, you know, he becomes the missionary to the Gentiles. Anyway, they're up north, and they're along the Mediterranean coast, the region of Tyre and Sidon. And these people have been a thorn in God's people's side, the Israelite side, from the time they entered the Holy Land. We hear that this woman of concern this evening is a Canaanite. She's an outsider. She is a Gentile. And they're in there. So Jesus is actually outside of the borders of Israel. And this is the only time he really does that. And this is the group of people that they could never dislocate. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, political, uh, technological. But the God's people, when they came into the Holy Land, you know, God said, you're going to, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to dispossess those people. And you're going to live in their houses, and you're going to eat, eat of their grapes. I'm not making a political statement here, so don't read into it. This is what God had intended. If he's God, you're not. Neither am I. So anyway, this region up north, though, they could never dislocate these people, and they were a constant thorn in God's people's side. Constant. And this, so Jesus is there. He's outside, and he's got his disciples with him. And this Canaanite, we're told she's a Canaanite. Uh, he's up in Tyre and Sidon, and she comes from that region. She's she's one of them. She's not living in Israel. And she cries out, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Now, as the church goes out, that's what we run into. You know, we run into people that are looking for God's mercy, that, are, that, that he sends our way. The Holy Spirit brings people to his church. Read the book of Acts. When we studied that a few months ago, 
that's very important to remember. Yes, the Holy Spirit is God. He does these miraculous things. But the problem is we are in our culture, and there's a lot of reasons for this, and they're all wrong. We divorce. We divorce it's like the scripture is this entity all by himself that isn't bringing us to how it is that we're saved, which is Christ. How do you know you're saved? You have to know the answer to that question. Do you feel the Spirit? What if you don't feel the Spirit? Um, does that mean you don't have the Spirit? And you see that, those are not the right questions to ask. You know you're saved because the Spirit brings you to Christ. In the book of Acts, you see it over and over again. You see the Spirit doing miraculous things, but inevitably, he brings the hearer and the preacher together. The preacher proclaims the word of Christ, and then baptism, sacrament. Baptism, of course, is often the focus because these are new converts that often we hear about in Acts. But we also hear about the Lord's Supper as well. The breaking of bread is uh, 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 is one of Luke's favorite terms for it. So, the the Spirit has brought, whatever happens, this woman comes to Jesus because she's got nowhere else to go. And that's what happens in church. People find, the Spirit says, you want answers? And not, not that the church is going to solve the real problem you have, but, but you want to answer like why you're here, what your work is, you know, who's running the Christmas and stuff like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna send you to the church, and you're gonna hear the word of God proclaimed. And the word of God, you're gonna hear about how you're loved by God, how you're created by God, what you're created to do, not necessarily your day to day vocation, but what it means to be a steward of God's kingdom, uh, of the this earth that He's given us, what it means to be a child of God, how we love our neighbor, all the things we learn. So. Anyway, have mercy on me. This is what we'll say tomorrow morning when we gather. We'll say, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. That's really the beginning of the service. We invoke first. We do the same thing as we did. We call out upon God. He's there. That's his promise. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. It's not even a prayer for herself. You know, that maybe you could argue that's a selfish prayer. She's like, my daughter. You know, who, who, which one of us would turn our back and somebody that came, came to us carrying their children? Uh, I find my soft, my heart very soft. I mean, I can I can tend to be a little more, maybe cynical is not the right word, although sometimes I, I suppose I fall into that and I repent of that. But I, it's much easier when people need help for something if they got kids in the house and stuff like that. Not that they bring them to you and stuff like that, but it, you, you know, there, there's just something about children that you're like, we need to help them. You, know, you don't want children to be cold. You don't want children to be hungry. You don't want children to be without water. Parents might make boneheaded decisions, you know, and if they're, if they're adults, maybe re you refer them to the shelter and stuff like that or, or help them in another way. But if there's children involved, you know, I mean, aren't we all that way? I think so. I mean, I, I see that amongst God's people when families are in crisis and there's children around, people gather around them and help and make sure the children are cared for and stuff like that. Anyway, so you can't argue that this you know, woman is being selfish. She's like, you know, my, my child is demon-possessed. As we hear elsewhere is that, you know, that could, the demons could throw people into fire. They could imagine the, 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 the injuries they'd inflict on the body because people would often be chained to try to control them and they'd break those chains apart. Uh, demon possession can be very difficult, very painful, very injurious to the person being both spiritually, of course, and physically to the person who is demon-possessed. A daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. That's all we hear. And our, our Lord's, our merciful Lord, our loving Lord, our God of steadfast love, his answer is to say nothing. And this is what we begin to learn. Because who's there? Not just her and him, but the disciples. Okay? So, he doesn't answer a word. Now, the disciples come to him, and all we have is the words on the page, so it's hard to read their emotions. Are they, are they thinking that she's a pest? Send her away? You know, that, that would be not necessarily abnormal for them. Because remember, they're outside the Holy Land. They're entire inside, and she's a Canaanite. So it wouldn't necessarily be an unnatural way for them to think, oh, she's one of them, just send her away, get her out of here. And, or, or it could be that answer her prayer. All right, she's crying out after us. And he answers, and maybe this is where we see a little bit, maybe we can help answer that question that I just posed those two questions. Those two questions is with what his response is. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Brazil. So maybe if we read that, we can maybe say that he is saying, they're saying, you got to help her. Right? And again, it's all a teaching moment for them and us. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now remember, outsider. She's an outsider. 
So he's saying, he's speaking the truth. All we can say is, amen. You know, he was sent, he's an Israelite himself. He's a Jew. All right, he comes, and they're the people that have the prophecies, the target side of them, the prophecies about, uh, the, you know, who's going to come. Paul's going to talk about this in his epistles. But, you know, they are the ones, they're, they're the keepers of that covenant. Of God, you know, from going all the way back to Abraham, that God, actually going back all the way to Eve, that God would bless all nations through them. And there's Jesus. All right. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what salvation is going to go out from that. She, but she came and knelt before him, saying, "Lord, help me." So again, she says, "What we will say tomorrow, Lord, have mercy, Lord, help me." And he answered, "I imagine her look, him looking at her. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs." <laughs> imagine me saying that to anybody in the congregation. He's God. He doesn't have to answer to me or you. And again, what is he trying to teach us about him, about the church? Okay. She said, now notice her response. She says, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumb that falls from their master's table. Now, you remember that. When I say something, speaking as the pastor, that is the word of Christ, and it is and it offends you. You know, some people leave the church in a huff. I, you know, I can't believe or, or maybe I have to call you on the carpet and say, would you please knock it off? Or you start gossiping about your neighbor. Said, you know, you're only telling me one half of the story, and I can't possibly know the other half, half of the story, so you need to be quiet about it. Or whatever it is. You know, we do this to each other, for each other, as Christians. But pastors do it for you. Not because, you know, I'm mad at you, because, you know, you just, you need to repent. We need to try to live our lives as God's people. So anyway, um, you know, often people, you know, oh, how dare he, and stuff like that. I've had to block people. I think I shared this a few weeks ago, and you know, having to block people, I don't have to do it very often, but block people from Facebook because they want to air their daughter dirty laundry on the on the on the on the on the, on the, the they want to gripe about some pastor or some other parishioner on the church's Facebook page of something that happened twenty years ago. First of all, I'm like, you know, can't you just let it go? And can't you just forgive as you have been forgiven? I mean that's part of it. And obviously the often these are people that live far away and I can't really dialogue with them personally other than on Facebook and say, I'm blocking you, here's why. Right, you know, and the thing is, like, you know, all we know is one half of it anyway. You know, we don't know what the other person was thinking, saying, doing, or why they behave the way they do. There's, there's no opportunity for them to do that there, or nor should they have to do that there. You know, so anyway, you can imagine the response when I, when I reach out to somebody and say, I'm blocking you. Here's why. <laughs> well, you know, and you don't get to hear about it because I blocked them. Right, kind of a win-win. But you know, they, they usually don't receive that news with great joy. Anyway, notice what this woman does. She doesn't say, you called me what? You know, how dare you? She says, yes. Now, tomorrow we're going to say this word three or four times in the service. And the word is amen, which means this is true. Now, you pay attention to where we say that in the service tomorrow. We only say it when God speaks. So we invoke, we know the promise of, of uh, God says, you call upon me, I'll be there. So we say in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen, because what we're saying there is that God promises to be with us. Call upon me. Amen. He's there. This is true. Okay. And then we, I'll absolve you of your sins. You'll say amen because it's true. God has given me that authority as the pastor to absolve you of your sins. You might as well be standing before him. I'm standing there in the stead and by the command, and you are forgiven, and you just simply say amen. What else can you say? What else do you need to say? You're saying, yes, this is true. I'm forgiven. And then we'll say it. Um, at the end of the prayers, as we knowing that God is going to hear our petitions, yes, Lord, this is true. Your answer, you know, you will answer us. And then we say it after we, we receive the Lord's Supper. We hear the words, this is his body and blood for you. Amen. Take eat, this is for you. Amen. And then the great amen at the end of the service. There might be a couple other times in there. But we say it when God speaks. Or God, we, we recall God's word of promise. Not when we promise anything, but when God speaks or we recall his word of promise, we say Yes. And when he speaks things we don't want to hear, yes. When he tells us the ugly truth about ourselves, we say yes. Amen. This is this woman. You know, she stands before the Lord and she says, whatever you say, amen. Whatever you say about me, amen. No arguing, no but, but, but. This is what faith looks like. 
And he acknowledges that. He says, this is, and he's telling that to them. So notice what happens here. Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as your desire, desire in her daughter's healing is done. So tomorrow we'll gather and people of faith will simply say, yes, Lord. You know, and yet we will be blessed. Our, our, we will be healed in the truest sense of the word. We are going to be absolved of our sins. We are going to be once again reminded that Christ died for us, and we're going to get that body and blood that died and is now seated at the right hand of God for our forgiveness. And we will leave church knowing what we are in Christ, which is wonderful. Wonderful. So, And all this is, goes back to what he says, the word, and we just simply say amen. So when we hear the ugly truth about ourselves, and tomorrow the texts are kind of heavy. You know, so we're not going to feel good. Uh, but that's okay. We're going we're gonna to remember the gospel. We're going to receive the forgiveness of Christ our Lord. But as his people, we're going to hear some kind of difficult things about what he says about us and the world around us. And, you know, those things aren't going to make us feel good. They're going to they're gonna call us, a, remind us of our need for per, repentance. But yet, and what are we going to argue with them? No, we're going to say, amen, you're right. You know, Lord, help me, help me repent. Help me think of these things and do things properly. But the forgiveness is going to be there and showered upon us. It's not going to be withheld saying, well, let's see how we did this week. And then here, it, we'll, we'll try again next week. We'll see how we're doing. And then we'll get forgiveness. We will be absolved. We'll start the service with absolution and with a great forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ, it'll be magnificent. And yes, we will be called to repentance. And when the Lord speaks to us, we will simply say, yes, Lord. And he will say, yep, yeah, that's what faith looks like. You are blessed because we are forgiven in him and receive him. Remarkable thing that he is teaching the church about how the church is going to go out. We're going to have that one tool, which is his word. What else do we need? Nothing. And that tool it's going to proclaim Christ, the things we don't want to hear about ourselves, and the things, the wonderful things about who God is. And he's going to do things like this. He's going to say, this is who you are, you know. You know, you know I'm not giving this to the dogs. You know, we're going to say, oh, we're not going to say that. We're going to say, yes, Lord. And his answer always is, when we come around and say, Lord, have mercy, his answer is, yes, my child. All right. I can go on about that. And there's a couple of things we should have said about the other text, but let's confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, strengthen us in these dark and latter days that we may remain faithful until the very end. We pray, as always, for the renewal of those who are withering in the faith or who have fallen away, often people who are very close to us, that you may break down the walls that they have set up for themselves and move into their hearts and open their eyes and their ears to your holy will and forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we pray for receptive hearts and minds to your word tomorrow as we gather, and bless me and my brothers as we prepare to administer and proclaim the Holy Word and the gifts and the people that you will gather tomorrow as they hear the Word and receive the gifts. As always, we pray for those who are crying out for healing, Myron, Dennis, Dave, Don, Wayne, Ardo, Klaus, Lure, Cecil, Lorena, Aaron, Allison, Allie, Scott, Amy, Don, Fern, Ashley, Camden, 
Jason, Bob, Jim, Clint, Beth, Chris, Eric, Tom, Paul, Brad, Christy, Jeff, Dylan, Jeremy, Marlis, Anita, Dave, Karen, Sue, Tim, Ron, Bert, Lori, Chris, John, Heather, Dawn, Liberty, Joe, Phil, Katie, and all who cry out to you. Heavenly Father, place your healing hand upon them. Lord God, Heavenly Father, keep farmers safe as they work to bring in the harvest that you have blessed us with. And may, may, their, uh, may their work be blessed and may their needs be met as they care for their families, as they provide for us. Bless those who travel, grant them safety in their travels and a safe arrival to their destination. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. Between your hands, I commend myself, my body, soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to sing a couple of stanzas of hymn 461, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives, who, who once was dead. He lives, my ever-living head. He lives, triumphant from the grave. He lives eternally to save. He lives, all glorious in the sky. He lives, exalted. In there on high. That stanzas one and two of eight of I Know That My Redeemer Lives, hymn 461. Brothers and sisters, I bid you a blessed rest. God's grace will see you tomorrow night. Good night.